So is Christmas good for you? Oh, good. Crazy. Ready to slide into the next year and kind of, you know how that is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great time, but it's such a, a busy time. You're right. Go ahead and let go. Well, good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm going to pull this closer because I like to be closer. And I am breaking every sound rule there is right now when it comes to the sound rule. Don't move the mic without having it be Be careful. And you hear all the knocking and everything else. Okay, we have been studying from the book of Psalms. We've looked at the book of Psalms, and we've discovered that it is not like any other book in the Bible itself. First of all, every other book of the Bible, the chapters actually are part of the book itself. When we look at the book of Psalms, it is a collection of Psalms, so each chapter practically is its own psalm. There are one or two here or there, like we've already discussed in the past, where it seems like they should be joined. But other than that, each chapter is its own song. Can you tell me how many people edited the book of Psalms? Can you remember that? It was three. We know that David was the editor of the first section, and there were two other unknown editors. The book of Psalms is divided into five different sections. Book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. Each one of these books correspond with the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There are different subcategories of Psalms in the book of Psalms. Psalms, and we are talking about the major collection known as the Psalms of Degrees. If you recall, the importance of the Psalms of Degrees was it was what the Jews would sing as they were traveling to the temple. It was a, they would also possibly sing them as they would approach the temple. One psalm would be a psalm on each step going up. We've gone through Psalm 120, which starts it off. And we are up to Psalm 123. So, if someone would please read Psalm 123 and verse 1. Psalm 123 and verse 1. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. I have a quote here. Um, that I took from a commentary, but it stated, Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye, when none but God is near. When we look at Psalm 123, once again, it is a prayer. And this prayer has been possibly titled, Oculus Sparens, which means the eye of hope. Psalm 123, as we start getting ready to dissect it, as we typically do, I'll go ahead and read it, and we'll go from there. Psalm 123, there's only four verses. But unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of their mistress. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. So as we start dissecting this chapter as we typically do, what do you think would be the key verse? of this passage, the one verse that summarizes the whole thing. Verse 
I would, I agree with you. Unto thee I lift up my eyes, O that dwellest in the heavens. When we look at this, this is exactly where the author has his viewpoint or his gaze focused, is it's on the heavens. And he's lifting up his eyes there because he's watching for God, for God to move. We see the, or for his guidance as well. We see this um, reiterated in verse uh, 2. He re-emphasizes this fact, and we'll talk about it later. But behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as their eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that until that he had mercy upon us. So he's looking unto God, he's lifting up his eyes, and he's looking unto the person he's looking for, the source of his salvation. What might be a key phrase or key phrases that we can take from this chapter? Have mercy upon us, O Lord. I agree with you wholeheartedly, brother, because when we look at this song, it's not a song of rejoicing, but it's a cry for help. And it's not just any kind of help, but he's crying out, God, have mercy on me. I need help. And what about key words or word? Mercy. Mercy, because that's what the, this author is looking for. The writer of Psalms 123, he's begging God or he's asking God for mercy. Are there any other words we might throw out? I would love eyes into there too because he's not just crying out for mercy, but he's watching for God to move or for God to give him a sign, for God to give him a gesture on which direction he should go. Now, as always, I like to look for times when any verse from this chapter has been quoted in the New Testament, and it does not appear that there are any verses from Psalm 123 that was quoted in the New Testament or alluded to that I could discover. Now, when we talk about the book of Psalms, it is a collection of psalms. And what is a psalm composed of? What are the two main elements of a psalm? Not rhyme and rhythm, but what makes up a psalm? And let me just bring it out because I'm being a little bit vague but I'm looking for something specific and the two never go well hand in hand. When we look at a song in our songbook, some songs are poems that all they do is they have music set to them. So when we look at the book of Psalms, we are looking at a song. So we're looking at something that may have been in a poetic form or is in a poetic form and have music applied to it. Or it was music that had poet, poet, poetry applied to it. So when we look at Psalm 123, what is the poetic style of it? And the best I could discover is that it's a staircase parallelism. We've had this discussion in the past on what staircase parallelism is before. And what it is is the second part of the verse develops the thought of the first without quoting words from the first part. And we don't have to understand it all, we really don't. That's in our notes to help us better understand it. If we have to, we can come back to it. If we're not interested, at least it gives us a better understanding of the thought pattern put behind it because this is, in a sense, religious art because it is the cry, it is a song, it's a song of praise and worship. Now, I could not discover any real history of the song. We've already talked about the songs of Ascent and what their use was for. But let's talk about Christ in the song. And this will bring out verse 2 in a little bit more detail, which we'll talk about later. But according to Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen in Psalm 123 as the oriental servant was an adept at reading the meaning of his master's slightest gesture, so let us live as our Lord did, with the eye keen to see the last indication of God's will. 
Now let's, we're going to shift and look at the division of the psalm. When we look at the division of the psalm, it seems like it all goes hand in hand. <coughs> there is all one song. It doesn't seem like one might, part might have been written at another time versus the other. I mean, there's only four psalms to begin with, so I mean, that's not a whole lot of writing. But there is a division, if we look at it, and possibly a division when it comes to music. Because if we look in verse 1, what pronoun do we see being used? Psalm 123 and verse 1. What pronoun What did you say, Mom? I said I. Yeah, that is exactly right. And if it's I, what position are we coming from when it comes to the song? It's coming from the position of the songwriter themselves. This is me, my, it's your taking possession of it. It's no different if you go home and Mom says, I can't have those cookies, they're hers. <laughs> or if I go to Brother Eli's house and he says, you can't have that chocolate, it's mine. It's a personal thing. But when we go down into verse 3, what pronoun is being used? Us. Us? We? Are those personal pronouns when it comes directly to the individual? No. So from a musical standpoint, and we know that the book of Psalms is the Jewish songbook. It was written, pro, um, compiled probably by David in the very beginning for something for the Levitical choir to sing. And we know when it comes to Hebrew music, to their poetry, it's not always one-sided, but they're sometimes two-sided. If we go back to the book of, I believe it's Deuteronomy, um, or at least to the books of Moses, we'll find the Israelites on one side of the valley on a mountain and on the other side of the valley on another mountain. Stating the law, they say one verse or one thing, and the very next thing is recited from the other side. When it's the same as seen from music, when we've come, we've discussed this in the past, that especially with, I think it was, I am not going to remember the song, it might have been Psalm 120, where I talked about the Ark of God coming back. But we know that there was one group inside the gates and another group outside, that it was a response area effect. One group would sing one thing, and then the other group would sing the second part. We kind of have the same feel as we read Psalm 123 as that. So in, we read the first two verses, personal pronoun. So it's almost as if one person is singing that, and then there's a group coming in from verses 3 and 4 that comes back with a responsory action. Or they're joining in with him as well. And in this case, it's more so they're joining in because there is no division within this book, uh, chapter that shows... Uh, question and a response, but rather it's all joined one and one. So it's as if one person is crying out, have mercy upon me, and the rest of the group says, you know what? We feel the same way. God, have mercy upon us. You all right? So they've been here as long as we've been here. But when we look at Psalm 123, is different or is opposite of the previous psalm. In Psalm 122, we have a responsory psalm where the gentleman is glad, or the author is glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord forever. And he talks about Jerusalem, and it's a psalm of praise and gladness. When we look at Psalm 123, it's the complete opposite. It's almost doom, gloom, I'm in the valley. But it's still a prayer nonetheless. In verse 1, it's interesting because as we read verse 1 in Psalm 123, the Bible states, Unto thee lift I up my eyes, O that dwellest in the heavens. This is different from the previous three verse, uh, chapters to begin with. When we go back to Psalm 120, Well, I'm not going back that far. We'll go back to Psalm 121. What does Psalm 121 and verse 1 read? I lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. 
So where is he lifting up his eyes? Unto the hills, his two surroundings. What about Psalm 122 and verse 1? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So where is this focus looking at? The house of the Lord. So we go from the person's surroundings to the temple. And then finally in Psalm 123, it surpasses all that. He's no longer looking at anything earthly, but he's looking directly into heaven to God. Now the same is true when we look at the world we live in. You know, people may get themselves in some situations or maybe something bad just happens because unfortunately in life, things do happen. Doesn't mean that the person did wrong. Doesn't mean that God's pouring out judgment for something in the past for someone else. <coughs> but just because of life, we know that because of Adam and Eve, well, Adam, sin and death enter into the world. People get sick. Sometimes it's nobody's fault. Sometimes people die. Sometimes it's nobody's fault. Sometimes, unfortunately, other, people's co other people cause the situation, whether it be a drunk driver or something else. It's not that person's fault. But in times of crisis, you can find those whose reliance is upon God and they have a relationship because they are the ones that so to so look to the hills because they know the help coming from God. They don't need to go to the temple all the time or go to church because they're in church all the time. They have a relationship with God. They know that they're going through a tough time. But they're going to look unto God because they know his help is already on its way. But what about those that don't go to church, that don't have a relationship with God? Where do you find them going? Typically, either to people that have a real relationship with God, or if it's bad enough, they're going to be in church itself. I can know of one woman that right now I can think of off the top of my head that I don't know what's going on in her life, but I know it's something drastic. And her response is, well, I need to get to church. Well, church is fine, but if you don't have a relationship with God, He's not going to look at the books on judgment saying, well, I see you went to church on this date, or this date, this date. You know, it'll lessen the punishment. That, do, that doesn't matter. But people who don't have a relationship with God, they're the ones you see going to the temple. They're the ones you see going to church. But when things get bad, bad, bad enough, and for some people they have to get really bad, they aren't the ones that are going to be looking to their surroundings because they know that God's ever present with them. They're not going to be the ones laying in bed with terrible pain, just crying out to God and saying, God, I need you to heal me right now, with faith and confidence that he's going to do it. They'd be the ones that are going to church and say, you know what, I need something more. So now they're going to look to God in heaven. I've gone to church, I've tried church, but church isn't doing anything for me. Maybe it's about time I get right with God. This is almost what we're seeing right here in Psalm 123 and verse 1. It's the person who's so desperate, he's moved past um, the temple and just going to church, but he needs help directly for God, and he doesn't know what else to do, so he looks directly to God. In verse 2, we get the sense that this person here is actually does actually have a relationship with God. And we see that based upon the fact that it states, Behold, the, as the eyes of the servants look into the hands of their masters, and as the eyes of the maiden under the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God unto thee, that unto, until that he have mercy upon us. And we're in Psalm 123, if that makes any difference, but we're spending a lot of time there analyzing it and studying it. And Psalm 123, verse 2 that we've just read, as we've seen in the previous portion when we talk about Christ being seen in this psalm according to Keith L. Brooks. The servant, the oriental servant would not have a verbal relationship with his master. But rather is more one of hand gestures. The master made some type of sign with his uh, hands and the servant had to do it. Which means 
And that's where your commands are coming from. You can't listen to it with your ears, but your eyes have to be focused on the hands of your master because he's going to direct you on what to do, where to go, and what needs to be done. So they always had to be watching. The other thing mentioned in Psalm um, chapter 123 and verse 2 is the eyes of the maiden upon her mistress. And I might have that wrong. To get myself out of trouble, I'm going to read that. Oh, I was right. Now, I took this from a commentary, so no backlash on me. But the commentator I read after said that women have a lot more to say, and they can be a lot more in cruel of a master than men can be. And because they demanded a whole lot more, the maidens actually had to be a lot more aware of the hands because they had a lot more orders to be instructed for them. But regardless of the situation, as Christians, our eyes need to be on the hands of God. You know, not everything is coming from a audible voice of God. Sometimes we get that, sometimes we don't. When we're talking about sin and direction in life sometimes, sometimes all we have to do is break open the Word of God and the Word of God has the instruction for it. It really does. If somebody wants to say, well, that's not sin, well, we don't need an audible voice from God to say what is sin and what's not. Right? There's the Bible. Break it open. Find a verse. If it's sin, it'll be marked in there. Because there are only so many sins. Believe it or not. And in that case, we don't need to have the audible voice of God. There are times in our life where we may be going through some stuff and we won't hear the audible voice of God. But if we would step back and watch we could probably see the hand of God moving in that situation. We may not, it may not be as fast as we would like. And it's one of those things that if we were so wrapped up in the situation to begin with and didn't take that step back, we could miss it in the first place. I remember years and years ago, I got the first assistant manager we had all over automotive that had that title that was back there all the time. She would pull me off to the side and yell at me for things for no reason. But you know what it was? It wasn't anything I did. But what it was was she was under conviction. And people under conviction re respond differently. Some people might come to the altar and get right right away. If they're in a public sitting, they might ask how they can get right or what they must do. Other people might get angry because they don't know how to respond. But God is dealing with them even if they don't realize it. And it's nothing that you did and it's nothing that I did. Whether it's being taken out on us or not. But if we keep ourselves in those situations and don't step back, we may, may not see the signs and we may not see God's hand for what's really going on. And we could take it personally. But when we step back and we see the hand of God working, we can take into perspective the whole situation as a whole. Now moving on to verse 3. We find the cause of why this person is experiencing so much gloom. And we can feel it is hurting. He says, or he writes, Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. So the very first thing he does is he cries unto God with mercy. We see something actually remarkable in this passage. He knows his problem. And he knows he needs help. So instead of listing his problem first, he realizes his position to God. You know, to God, I am nothing. To God, I'm the one that is under judgment. And I need to get things right within myself. If we are going to see a difference in our lives, in any area we struggle with, we need to recognize our position with God. 
and realize who he is. We are the creature. We are the created. We are not the creator. We are lowly. God is all supreme. And when it comes to our situation, God is the only one that help, can help us. We can't do anything of our own. God is the only one who can deliver us from his wrath. And then he reveals his problem. You know, before we can get help from God, we need to realize that we have a problem. And we need to recognize that problem. And once we recognize it, we must be willing to admit that problem. And if not to somebody else, because frankly, everybody doesn't need to know our business. If it's personal between us and God, it's personal between us and God. The entire church world doesn't need to know. If it affects them and you do somebody wrong, then you make it right with that person. But this person, this author, did not have a situation going on with another person per se, but he had a problem within himself. And he needed God's help to fix the problem. And what was his problem? He was full of contempt. He had hatred. He had bitterness. He was scorning, had scorning towards each, towards somebody. He looked upon somebody with derision or looked down on them. He knew he had a problem within himself. And he needed God to help him to fix it. You know, if we're going to have anything change in our life, we need to have God help us. There are things that maybe we can do it on our own. But there are other times that there's no other way that we're going to get past this but through the power of the Holy Ghost. There are some things that if we dwell on them enough, they can consume our mind. They can consume our thoughts. They can consume our life. They can consume the way that we live in general. The devil will bring us down and put us into captivity any way he can. And if we're in a place of contempt, if we're in a place of derision, probably nine times out of ten, seven times out of ten, is because we lost focus of God. We're not reading, reading our Bible the way we're supposed to be. We're not praying the way we're supposed to be. Because when we're praying, we're allowing the Holy Ghost to change us. When we pray in tongues, the Holy Ghost is praying through us things we don't even need. Perhaps it's for somebody else. Perhaps it's the Holy Ghost praying for a certain area in our life that needs to be changed. An area that only He can help us to overcome. And then finally, in verse 4, our soul is exceedingly filled with scorning of all those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. So he didn't say that it's just a slight problem. But it's a great problem. His soul is exceedingly filled with scorning of those that are at ease. Perhaps he's thinking about it all the time. Perhaps the way he looks at people has changed. Perhaps the way he lives his own life is not what it should be. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and of love of a sound mind. And this person has grown, has been engulfed so much by his Contempt that perhaps it's all he thinks about. Perhaps it's taken over every area of his life or is getting close. And he realizes that he needs freedom. He needs uh, emotional freedom. But more than that, he needs spiritual freedom. He feels that he is probably possibly far from God. Perhaps he feels like day in and day out that God has given up on him or that God should give up on him because he's not able to live up to the title of being Christian because it has consumed him. So when we go back to verse 1, that's where it lies. God, I, I need to do more than just go to your house. 
as in verse um, chapter 122. I need that relationship with you, but more than that or just as much, I need you to deliver me. You are the only one that can do this. Perhaps this gentleman is the same as the woman with the issue of blood in the sense that he's done everything he can think of. He does not know what else to do. He does not know where else to go. Perhaps he's been to every emotional support group out there to try to get help, but he has not found release, relief. How is that any different than us today? We all struggle with things in our own life. It may not be contempt, but we all struggle with things. Is it everybody's business? No, it's not everybody's business. But it's between us and God. And we all can relate with this individual in Psalm 123 and say, I have been there. <laughs> not that I'm giving up on God. Not that I've stopped giving to church. But it's where we get such, to such a spiritual and emotional standpoint where we get state and recognize that, God, I have this problem. God, I just cannot seem to get past it or get over it. But I need your help. And maybe it's taken us to a sleepless night. Maybe it's taken us to our knees for hours on end. Maybe it's taken us to a place of prayer for days on end. Literally, as we're going about our everyday business, we have that feeling in our heart. You know, God, I need it to go. God, I need this taken care of. God, I can't live with this anymore. It's eating up at me. Not that we've lost sight of God or who he is or where he's at. But God, I just need you to move in a way like never before. God, transform me even farther into the image of Jesus Christ. God, take this from me. And maybe he won't take it away completely. But he'll give us victory for the moment. And that doesn't mean that it won't be a weak spot, because we all know that the devil loves weak spots. But... What did it say in verse 2? That the mistress was watching for the hands of the maid. The servant was watching the hands of the master. We are now aware of the situation. We're aware of our problem. We've gotten help. We've gotten deliverance. So when the enemy comes in next time and starts trying to get a foothold, we're already aware of his hand working. We can already recognize the hand of God. But if we're careful and watch one another, we can also recognize the hand of the enemy. That way when he comes in and he starts trying to sneak in, we say, oh no, devil, in the name of Jesus, you take your minions and you get out of here. You had a stronghold before, but you're not getting it back. It's taken over, the Holy Ghost has control of it. Because if we're not careful and watchful for his hand either, he will creep back in. But may we be victorious through the power of the Holy Ghost. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that your angels would be at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, making himself visible if he so chooses. I know that the song leader and the musicians, as they lead us in the worship, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, Lord. I pray that you would anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, Lord. And anoint our hearts and our minds that they would be prepared for you, that they would be good soil for your word to follow on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives and be even farther transformed in the very image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.